Please connect with us on social media, Twitter and Facebook at NeuroethicsUBC and our event hashtags, Brain Week and Neuroethics. And with all that preamble, let me just take a minute to introduce Dr. Lipsman. He is a neurosurgeon and scientist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Toronto. He's currently director of Sunnybrook's Harkwell Center for Neuromodulation and the clinical director of Sunnybrook's Focused Ultrasound Center for Excellence, where he's developed several world, world first trials using deep brain stimulation and focused ultrasound for difficult to treat neurological conditions. As an in-demand speaker, he has over 160 publications, including in the Lancet Nature Reviews and New England Journal of Medicine. He also is co-lead with Dr. Patrick McDonald and myself of the Pan-Canadian Neuroethics, uh, Neurotechnology Ethics Consortium, PCNEC, whose goal is to bring ethics to the foreground of Canadian and worldwide functional neurosurgery. And with that, Dr. Lipsman, welcome, and thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Judy, for that. It's uh, an absolute uh, privilege and honor. Uh, and thank you so much for the invitation. It's great uh, to see you and everybody here. Um, obviously, uh, would be better in person. Uh, it would be great to see you in person. And, uh, you know, last year we had grand plans uh, to do this in person, but I'm glad that we can do this in any way we can and uh, to see everybody. So, um, so again, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do, I'll, 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 I've prepared some slides, uh, but I'm hoping to make this as informal as possible um, in true sort of seminar fashion. My slides are sparse. The purpose of the slides really are to discuss um, my, my journey in, in neuroethics uh, and in neuromodulation specifically as a neurosurgeon and uh, what that journey has been, uh, what uh, I feel are some of the, um, the major uh, lessons that I've learned along the way, uh, and what some of the uh, experiences have been so far. And, you know, needless to say, and I don't have to mention to this group, you know, there's a tremendous amount we can learn from each other as a community. Uh, those of us interested in applied neuroscience and how we can develop therapies and learn about the brain. Um, but, you know, we, we really are approaching an inflection point in the field where there's so much to do. And I'll talk about PCNEC at the end and the opportunities that, that you know, that may exist. But, um, but again, feel free to ask any questions along the way and we can discuss it at the end. So I think, you know, it's only right to, to talk about, you know, beginning my personal journey in neuroethics so far, which I don't, I didn't mean for this sinusoidal wave to suggest or imply ups and downs. It's only been ups. It's only been a very positive experience, but I just wanted to fit everything on the page. But, you know, my interest uh, has always been in psychology and human behavior. And I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto in that in research psychology, always interested in predominantly abnormal psychology and abnormal human behavior and what we can ultimately attribute those to. And, and all those discussions have always led me back to, to the brain. And, and when I went to medical school at Queen's University, I met uh, Sandra Taylor, uh, who is a uh, PhD scientist, and, and she introduced me to, to the field of bioethics, really, and, and really that interface between uh, ethics and medicine and how uh, clinical decision-making so often uh, overlaps uh, and ought to overlap with ethical decision-making and, and how the role of the bioethicist uh, as part of the healthcare team is so key, underappreciated and, and key. And those initial studies really uh, were allowed me to, to dip my foot in the water, my toe in the water, really, in ethics and expand that. And, and, and around this time, my, my interest in neuroscience uh, gravitated to, to psychiatry and ultimately to neurosurgery and uh, in psychiatric neurosurgery specifically. And, and to that end, I sought out uh, experts at the University of Toronto and decided to pursue a residency training in, in neurosurgery with really the, the, the goal of developing you know, therapies for treatment-resistant psychiatric disease, recognizing uh, the, the, the challenges uh, in that field specifically. And as with many neurosurgery residents, uh, you know, my interest in, in ethics was only, um, only uh, sort of um, expanded by, by meeting Dr. Bernstein, Mark Bernstein, who's a neurosurgeon at Toronto Western Hospital. And, and Dr. Bernstein introduced me to neurosurgical ethics and, and the idea that here we have a specialty in a field way, which is fraught with, uh, you know, ethical questions and ethical issues. Uh, a, you know, uh, Dr. Bernstein does a lot of neuro-oncology, a lot of end-of-life care, and, and, and really, you know, uh, impressed upon me the, the critical importance of tackling the big issues, of addressing the big issues, 
uh, of which there are no lack of in neurosurgery. Um, that introduced me to the field of neuroethics specifically. Uh, and what was always been interesting to me was the idea of neuroethics, of the ethics of neurosurgery or neuroscience and the neuroscience of ethics. And uh, that introduced me also to, to the work of Walter Glennon and Judy and others in the field who are uh, leaders in the field uh, and who, who are really pioneers uh, in, 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 in sort of in, in applying these key principles to, to the neurosciences. And this really set me off on that journey. Around that time, I started my PhD with Dr. Andres Lozano at Toronto Western Hospital. And, and again, that's where my interest in in neuromodulation really germinated and, and took form. Uh, my PhD was specifically in deep brain stimulation for treatment resistant anorexia nervosa, where we performed the first trial of DBS for these indications in these patients. And there, you know, the, the, it really allowed my interest in, in ethics to, to grow in parallel with my interest in neurosurgery, because in one field, in one, in one avenue of neurosurgery, you had all those issues of uh, consent, vulnerability, uh, access to novel neurotechnology, and the idea of early phase trials for novel indication. So it really allowed a lot, a lot of those interests to crystallize. That led me to um, uh, develop uh, phase one trials in neuromodulation, and I'll discuss some of the other uh, techniques and modalities that we're using, and, and, and got me plugged into some of the neurosurgical and other societies to try to hone in and, and, and sort of hammer down, well, what are the criteria for use of these, of these tools? What are the guidelines for use? They started collaboration with Jennifer Chandler in Ottawa, looking at the legal aspects of psychiatric surgery, not only in North America, but around the world. What are the variations in practice and how can we apply those um, in our local jurisdiction and elsewhere as well? So really, uh, you know, from that position to try to, to, to mold and shape the field that we're in. And then a couple of years ago, I reached out again to, to, to Judy and to Pat, uh, Neuroethics Corps, but now Neuroethics Canada. Um, and to try to see if we can work on this together. I mean, I think we had very common interests and our interests gelled very well. And that led us to, to found the, the Pan-Canadian Neurotechnology Ethics uh, uh, Consortium or collaboration. The C is up to your interpretation, NPCNEC. But, um, but we, which is really, um, in my view, one of the most exciting things that I'm doing right now, which is really getting together the key stakeholders across the country from coast to coast who are actively engaged in neurotechnology uh, is a group of scholars, as you know, uh, ranging from psychologists, psychiatrists, neurosurgeons, and, and ethicists across the board. And this is where, where I work now. So I work at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. This is a, a hospital, for those of you who don't know, in Midtown Toronto. It's the largest by volume hospital in Canada, actually. And I'm fortunate because brain sciences is, is a major focus of the hospital. So we're quite strong in stroke and brain trauma and in uh, biological psychiatry, brain tumors, et cetera. Um, several years ago, I became involved in a clinical trials program looking at focused ultrasound when this is the, the helmet that we're using. In blue here is Kalervo Hinnanen, who's our VP of research actually, who helped invent this device. And it's with this device that we're investigating new ways of intervening and interacting with the brain in conditions where, um, where we could potentially do that. And these range from, from neurologic to psychiatric conditions. So another new tool, another new way of interacting with the brain. So my interest in neuroethics and neurosurgery is, is, uh, is of a lot of interest, but, but distilled into three main areas that I'm currently interested in. The first is, is early phase clinical trials of novel neurotechnology, specifically asking about readiness for phase one trials. This is, this is where our sweet spot is currently in our center and in my lab, uh, phase one, phase zero trials, early first in human trials. And the question that we're frequently asking is how do we, how do we evaluate and discuss risk in the context of those trials when we know very little about the risks, when the benefits may not be, may not be huge, and the main benefit is to provide data for larger trials. How do we assess uh, the risks of those kinds of trials and allow them to go forward? Really, we're, we're interested in, in determining if risk is an absolute or a relative concept, and, you know, arguing that it, it is in fact a relative concept, that if you ask patients about the risk for a certain procedure or technology, and if you ask clinicians 
And even if you ask different types of clinicians, you're going to get different answers. You're going to get variability and comfort with risk. So that's critical when you're evaluating whether or not to proceed with the trial or not. And, you know, the, the other question we're asking is, you know, are early phase trials ethically acceptable uh, in advanced diseases such as Alzheimer's uh, disease or advanced Parkinson's disease or even advanced brain tumors? Are we, where do we draw the line in, in allowing uh, new technology to be trialed in conditions where, for example, in the dementias, where, where there may not be a full appreciation for exactly what, what has happened? The other area I'm really interested in is the idea of treatment-resistant disease, specifically in the context of psychiatry. How do we define these? Um, because when we're talking about trialing novel technology, it's critical to establish that. If you're trialing a device or any technique in a new population, it's critical to do that, to select that population properly. Uh, and in the context of psychiatry, it's most commonly going to be treatment-resistant states. How do you know that somebody is treatment-resistant? There are some guidelines up there, but they are all imperfect. So, you know, defining that has profound implications for, for therapeutic trials. And when, you know, a lot of my work is inspired by my conversations with, with patients uh, in the office. And a lot of this has to do with uh, 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 therapeutic misconception and the idea of vulnerability and consent in that process and in those discussions. And all of those have particularly particular resonance in the context of, of psychiatry. In the last area is really the idea of surgical innovation in general. So as we, we exist in a very unique environment in Canada where um, it's a small enough community uh, in, in the neurosciences and the applied neurosciences that we can work together across multiple centers to develop a lot of these treatments. Um, and we have, as a result, can develop closer relationships with our research ethics boards and with our, with our federal Health Canada regulatory authorities. It's much easier, for example, than in the U.S., uh, where the FDA is, a, is a, a real behemoth to navigate. But what are the implications and what are the differential implications for, for devices, for novel devices and novel tools uh, that we use to interact with the brain? How do, we, how do we smooth that process? How do we optimize that process when we do develop a new device or a new treatment? What are the differences and similarities between, for example, a novel brain device and a novel brain drug? Uh, are they are they one and the same, and or or are there shades of gray? So the the area that I'm, I'm most interested in uh, is neuromodulation, and there are variable definitions out there. This is the one that I I use and I have. Uh, and when we talk about neuromodulation, we're talking about typically focal, as opposed to more widespread, but focal direct to brain or direct to circuit interventions, with the express purpose of stopping, starting, or influencing activity in structural parts of larger synaptically connected networks. So what does this mean? Basically it's direct to circuit ways of intervening in the brain. And several key things stand out here. And examples of these technology are things like deep brain stimulation, TMS, and focused ultrasound. And there's actually a lot to unpack in that sentence. And we can spend a long time talking about it, but you know, suffice it to say that neuromodulation itself as a field has led to a restructuring or, 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 a, or a new understanding of, of the origins of human behavior from more structural based uh, uh, explanations to more circuit based explanations. And, and things like DBS have allowed us to do that. And, and then the public talk uh, that I'll give uh, in the next hour, I'll go into how that, how that has been done. Now, what do all neuromodulation strategies these days or virtually all of them have in common? Well, they're usually new. Uh, they usually deal with a device or some kind of technological device. There's usually some kind of imaging or brain imaging involved or some aspect of, of imaging. They're for novel indications. They're touted as being less invasive, but they have an unknown risk profile just because we haven't tried it in, in, in millions of patients yet. They usually exist in a kind of regulatory gray zone, as I mentioned. Uh, so they're not quite a device exclusively sometimes, and they're not quite a drug, or, or maybe they're a new generation of a device. So they do exist in a kind of, of gray zone where, where there's less guidance to help us. And finally, they're, they're often associated with much fanfare. So a lot of publicity, a lot of public attention, and usually industry backing. So each one of these, in my view, is its own ethical minefield that we sort of have to navigate in the neuromodulation space. So novel brain image guided, novel indications, all of these can be taken on as unique questions uh, to tackle in the context of these technologies and need to be actually tackled 
in order for us to res responsibly investigate and use these tools. So um, to that end, uh, a few questions that I've, that I've posed and we're trying to explore within PCNEC are things like why and in whom should we intervene? How should we intervene? And when, at what stage is each stage to intervene? So just, um, just to give you a sense or a flavor of the kind of questions I'm interested in, when we look at the spectrum of disease states, we can really display these from healthy all the way to treatment resistant with all the different uh, disease states in between, ranging from those who are um, maybe pre-symptomatic or symptomatic, but before they have a diagnosis, and a good example is somebody like who has mild cognitive impairment, uh, but pre-Alzheimer's disease and those who have established disease. So if you have a novel tool, a novel device, let's say, and you want to intervene or investigate its, its safety or efficacy in the state, at what stage of the disease process are you going to do this and how, how are you going to guide this, let's say, if you want to develop a phase one trial? So one quick way is to look at the benefit, the, the, the risk and invasiveness of the device. And, and arguably, the more invasive something is, of course, the greater that risk is going to be. So that's important to know. So if you have something that requires brain surgery, uh, the risk of that is going to be higher. Um, the, the further along somebody is in the stage, arguably, the larger the risk tolerance uh, may be. So if somebody has very advanced stages, you may, for example, tolerate higher risks than if somebody was at an earlier stage where your risk tolerance may not be as high. And this is something called the nothing to lose phenomenon. If somebody already has advanced, for example, ALS or advanced recurrent glioblastoma multiforme, and you're, you're, you're suggesting something highly experimental and very risky, those patients themselves may elect to, to participate in those, in those uh, trials versus somebody at much earlier stages of the disease. Put another way, yeah, you can look at the gain to lose ratio. And you can look at, you know, the, again, the, the, the larger that ratio is, so the more there is to gain and the less there is to lose, maybe you're gonna trial it in more advanced uh, disease stages. So the, this kind of calculus is something that we have done um, uh, sort of maybe on the fly or haven't really thought about systematically or operationalized in any way, but it's something that we do all the time. And for those of us who are directly involved in developing these treatments and in, in importantly in trialing these treatments, it's something I think it would be worth to operationalize and look at in a systematic way. When we look at the evolution of neuromodulation also, uh, and we look at the last, let's say, five or six decades, we, we see that it's evolved. It's evolved obviously significantly. It's gone from very crude, blind, largely permanent and exploratory procedures to much more precise image guided so-called reversible procedures with deep brain stimulation and much more hypothesis driven procedures. And when you look at it, you know, what do these things have in common? Well, they have to do with risk. You know, what, what we've done as a field is try to de-escalate the risk of these procedures. And in fact, when you talk to patients in clinic, when you're obtaining consent, or when you are proposing or suggesting, you know, the rationale behind a trial, almost universally, they will have two questions. This is what patients want to know. Does it work? Is it going to do more harm than good? Is it worth it? And is it safe? Is it going to hurt me? And am I going to be the same after the procedure? So efficacy and safety. These are the two main things that patients want. Again, it comes down to the question of risk. So it's almost like a theory of everything, of neuromodulation and neuroethics. Risk is, is part of that. You know, and, and when we're talking about readiness, we're talking about risk, really, in many ways. So if viewed through the lens of risk, then, some things can become a little clearer. You know, when do you intervene? Well, when the chance of efficacy will outweigh the chance of risk. So, so when, we, when we often talk about neuromodulation, we talk about the risk of doing something, but there's also, of course, the risk of not doing anything. And we want to make sure that we're not depriving people of the participation in, in a trial. How do we intervene? Well, in a way that balances the proportion of interventional risk with the risk of the disease. So diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, these are degenerative processes, the generative conditions that will worsen with time. We know that. We know that there are no effective means of modifying the natural history of these diseases. How do we balance that with the interventional risk that we're proposing? Well, that's when some of those spectral, spectral graphs that I showed you can come into play. So I'll just conclude, you know, going back to, to what I was talking about initially or the title of the talk, which is, you know, what can we each learn from each other? And of course, we're all one big community and there's a lot we can learn and we work together and Neurothics Canada personifies that in many ways. 
but for the for the neurosurgeons out there, uh, and myself and my community as well, I think it's critical to understand that these issues are of incredible importance, and that you know paying attention to them will actually enhance outcomes and provide much needed context to the research that we're doing. It enhances communication not only between investigators but also with patients. I find that some of the most rewarding conversations that I have with patients are about this, are about these kinds of issues and why we're doing what we're doing and how we're de-escalating risk and, and what the rationale is for what we're doing. So it really plays a profound role in that. And it also enriches our discussion and, and protocols and our technology. When we talk with industry, when we talk with regulatory authorities, Health Canada and others, it's just critical to speak the same language. Well, what about neuroethicists? Well, I think you know that the message that I'd like to convey there is to really view neurosurgery and neurology or the neuroscientists in general as a laboratory of neuroethics. I mean, here you have in one field all the drama and questions that you know we often think about in a rapidly changing field that needs guidance. There's no question that the period of evolution of our field is rapidly changing. And again, as I'll mention in the talk uh, next hour, our field is rapidly evolving, rapidly changing on the course of probably every decade, every 10 or 12 years, we see a new device, a new technology that requires some kind of guidance and context. Uh, so we, we're gonna need guidance on that. And the other thing is to try to disentangle at the very least in the public's eye, the difference between science fiction and what I call anticipatory ethics, or, or you know, how do we anticipate? How do we, how do we talk about these issues really before they happen or right on the cusp of them happening, things like less invasive brain surgery and other kinds of things, but not really cross the threshold to talk about things that are really quite fanciful that, that aren't really happening yet that really pique people's imagination. So for both parties, tremendous opportunities for collaboration. These are high stakes questions and, and they are very real opportunities to influence policy and decision-making and ultimately laws as well, and to enact meaningful change that, that's impactful. That's actually gonna make a difference in the way that we run trials and ultimately develop therapies. And to that end, uh, Judy, uh, together with Judy and Pat, uh, we've we founded and we, we're, we run the, the Pan-Canadian Neurotechnology Ethics Consortium. This is a, a wonderful collaboration between UBC and Neurothex Canada, as well as uh, Sunnybrook and the Harkwell Center of Neuromodulation here at, at UFT. And what uh, we have a web presence now, and I you know, encourage, if you guys haven't already, you guys are probably well-versed in this, but you know, should check it out. And what we've done is we've tried to hone in on um, six clusters or themes to try to capture really what are the burning questions in the field, ranging from placebos to vulnerable populations, the questions of readiness and risk that I mentioned, and uh, in other topics as well. So it's really in that context that I think would be a great opportunity to, to work together, to collaborate, uh, and to really, as I said, uh, enact uh, impactful, meaningful change. So, so with that, I'll conclude and thank you uh, again for the opportunity to speak uh, and happy to answer any questions and discuss uh, also what you guys are up to. Thanks very much. Nir, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I'm going to jump in with a comment and a question, if I may, and I'm sure there's uh, many burning questions. Um, but one comment is, you know, you bring up anticipatory ethics. And when we started doing neuroethics, and we called it pragmatic neuroethics and anticipatory ethics, a lot of criticisms we received was that we were engaging in fear mongering. So it wasn't just dissociating ethical issues from sci-fi. It was by anticipating we were actually promulgating fear among society. And I think, you know, what we've really worked to achieve is a fear mitigating strategy rather than a fear mongering strategy in that anticipatory space. Um, yeah. And I was wondering if you have any comments about yeah. that and then I'll ask my question. No, yeah, I mean, you took the word, I mean, that's exactly how I, how, how I, I view it. It's, it's a mitigation strategy, it's a public education strategy. Um, and um, it's a way to, to convey you know, the, the excitement we all feel about the, you know, the, the prospect for these, these tools and these technologies to shed light on, on circuits of the brain and how these diseases work and how we can potentially treat them. But I think it's, it's, it's critical. I, it's critical to have some, some realism and, some, and, some, some, and to ground it in, in reality. So I think that you know, um, you're, you're right. I can see how that may be the case, uh, but I think um, it's all about mit mitigation. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask a, a, one question and then we'll go to the chat. I see questions are coming in. In uh, studies that we've done at Neuroethics Canada um, and uh, with you and also in the area of spinal cord injury, we've learned that 
patients and physicians, patients and neurosurgeons don't always define risk and gain, um, invasiveness and risk and gain in the same way. And I would love to know if you can share with us, how do you um, embody different perspectives of risk and gain into your practice and ensuring that patients really uh, benefit from the interventions that you're offering them and that you're trialing with them? You know, it's, it's not easy, um, to be honest. It's a tension that I'm often um, discussing with my patients. I mean, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, our, if you want to call it sweet spot, is early phase trials, and it's phase zero, phase one trial. So this is the first time we are trialing something in a human patient. So, you know, last year or a few years ago, it was in an animal model. Now we're going to trial it in a human patient. And, um, and a good example is brain tumors, the glioblastoma, for example. Um, where uh, this is a malignant brain, brain cancer. So we know very well-defined outcomes in terms of survivals and, and progression-free and overall survivals despite maximal treatment. And here we have uh, you know, something like focus ultrasound where we wanna deliver therapies, chemotherapies to the brain through the, the blood-brain barrier. Um, it's, a, it's an early phase, phase trial. How do you balance you know, your hope for the technology with the fact that it may not actually do that much for that patient? And, you know, I really, I, in those situations, I, 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 a lot of it is, is dictated by the patient and their, their, um, that conversation. So uh, we talk about, we're very frank and open about um, the goals of the study, the rationale for the study, um, what um, our hopes and promises are, uh, but we try to temper that with realism. And for some patients, um, I would say for every, you know, three or four patients we talk to, one patient will, will proceed with it. Uh, and it's a, different, it's a different type of phenotype that agrees to participate in a phase one trial. And we've talked about this a little bit in the DBS world as well, where we're also doing deep brain stimulation trials for treatment resistant anorexia and addiction and depression, where is, is the type of patient that recruits in a phase one trial, is that really a typical patient with this condition? Or is there something different about that patient who would volunteer to participate in a phase one trial that maybe is distinct from other other populations. So I think that that's an important question as well. But uh, for me, um, in my simple minded view of things, it's all about communication. And it's all about laying it uh, being as transparent as possible. But something that I, I have started to do. Uh, and you know, it's interesting, because I think in medical school, we're taught to be very to not raise hopes for patients very much to not raise expectations a lot for patients to temper their expectations, to, to maybe um, uh, not raise too much hope, especially uh, for these malignant uh, conditions where we know the outcomes are gonna be poor. I've stopped doing that. Uh, and you know, I, I don't, I don't, um, yeah, uh, I don't know if something's changed in the view, but I don't, uh, I certainly don't um, take in a very negative line with patients, but I do, I do try to maintain as much as possible their hope and their promise uh, in this being a potential, potentially helpful treatment avenue. But, it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a fine line. You sort of have to, have to walk with them, especially with these very vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Pat, a question from uh, Dr. McDonald from Patrick. Um, and it is, can you give us your thoughts on the tension between innovation and regulation, as well as the inherent conflicts of interest between uh, industry and innovators? No, that's a really, um, I mean, I think this would be a, it's a whole seminar in itself. And I think Pat's a question is, um, you know, not only incredibly important, but it speaks at, it speaks to really the central, the central tension in the neuromodulation space, I would say. Um, and I can tell you that as recently as yesterday, uh, I had a conversation with somebody from industry. Um, it was in the context of a, a phase one, two trial that we're doing in, in brain tumors and, and ultrasound. Um, and it was sort of trying to navigate the needs, um, I wouldn't say demands, but the needs that the industry has uh, and the needs that I as a clinician scientist has in looking out for the best interest of my patient. And in you know, and it had to do with the, the, the methods of the trial and when, we're, when we do certain investigations and tests. So that is, that is almost, I would say, a daily occurrence that we're sort of having to navigate. Um, so I think there, you know, it's, you know, it's important to have basic rules of thumb uh, where you want to make sure that what you're doing is in the best interest of the patient, 
that safety is paramount, that everything is transparent, that documentation is clearly done, um, and that in every conversation with a patient, those things are, are kept uh, paramount. Now, we have a very good working relationship with our research ethics board and with Health Canada, uh, et cetera. I do find that sometimes it can be um, it can be a bit frustrating uh, to deal with, uh, with, with Health Canada, especially if we are trying to do or make incremental changes that really don't change the spirit or the nature of the trial very much. We have to go through, through the process in a very involved uh, way, which I do think stifles innovation uh, in some ways. You do have that. In the U.S. is a much worse situation where, where regulation really stifles innovation in many ways, and they, they sort of look to us as as beacons uh, uh, that are very different. So we do, we, I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. We have a very good in Canada uh, for these. We have the equivalent of humanitarian device exemptions. We have a, the possibility, for example, of doing off-label treatments for patients. If we have a Health Canada approved device, these are things that don't often happen in the U.S. environment because of their, their, the, the limitations they have there. So I think that, you know, it's, it's very much jurisdiction dependent, but that tension does exist. Um, and it can sometimes make, uh, make, make, make doing the science more difficult. But uh, for, for us, it's about keeping the patient's uh, well-being and safety paramount. Um, this is from Virika Harinko, who um, has been instrumental or was instrumental in working with us on our NIH grant on pediatric uh, drug-resistant epilepsy. I, I love her question. And it is, for children who are candidates of curative conventional resective surgery, is it ethically permissible for parents with a strong aversion to invasiveness to choose a potentially suboptimal, but I imagine less invasive neurotechnology as a treatment? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, um, I mean, Pat McDonald is the expert on this, and he's uh, he's he's on the um, on the conference as well. I mean, in my view, I mean, who are we to really you know make that judgment? Of course, I mean, I think that uh, you know the the. It's, it's that risk invasiveness uh, matrix that I, that I showed. And, and we do see that in some patients. We do see, uh, for example, if they're debating something like TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, versus something like bilateral ECT, bilateral electroconvulsive therapy, versus something like deep brain stimulation, which is an invasive brain operation. All three of those are um, investigational currently, even though there's a tremendous amount of evidence for TMS and, and ECT, but not bilateral ECT. Um, and all three are for the same disease. So they, patients go through that calculus all the time. So of course it's, it's, it's acceptable. They will take something and they will tell us this, they will take something less risky, but less effective because they're, they're worried uh, about the risk. So I, I definitely think it's, it's, it's feasible and understandable. Um, and, uh, and it is a calculus that they do all the time. The question is, you know, how do we uh, empirically study that? How do we operationalize that? How do we, you know, help them along in that process? And I think part of the answer is do more studies, you know, provide more data, uh, give some information about effectiveness and try to enhance that as much as possible and try to get the risk profile as close to zero as possible. Uh, but that calculus is done all the time. Yep. I'm curious in what Pat would say about that too. I, I'm not sure Pat's able to weigh in right now, even though he's listening. I had a message from him that. Yeah, no, no, I'm, yeah, of course. Um, yep. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, Roland. Uh, hi, Dr. Lipsman. Thanks hi. for a great talk. Um, you're, you were mentioning a couple of different uh, techniques in that last answer, and it, it brought up a question for me that sounds kind of abstractly philosophical, but I think has some, some practical import. And it's a question you might be familiar with from speaking with with Jen Chandler because um, she and I have thought about it some. What do you consider the boundary, the conceptual boundary of what is and isn't surgery or surgical, right? Because we we have techniques now that that seem to to straddle that boundary to some extent in terms of invasiveness, in terms of whether they're ablative or not, um, and you know to some extent it's a regulatory and and uh, statutory category, right? So I'm just interested in your intuitions on where where that boundary kind of lies. Yeah, uh, I mean, that, 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 that's really what, I would say that question is what inspired me to reach out to Judy and Pat initially two or three years ago uh, to, as a field, try to answer, you know, to be honest, because I, I, I don't know yet, uh, to be honest. I mean, I think that, um, for many patients, I can tell you, it's going through the skin. It's, you know, anything that goes through the skin is surgery. 
Uh, but then when I describe what we're doing with focused ultrasound ablative neurosurgery, where we're making a hole in the brain with ultrasound waves through the skull into the skin, I tell them, look, we're making a permanent hole. Oh yeah, that, that's surgery as well. That's, that's surgery. Well, but we're not going through this. So it can't only be going through skin. So, okay, so we're talking about making a permanent change to the brain. But we know that, for example, you know, if you're in cognitive behavioral therapy long enough, you're going to get permanent changes to circuits in the brain that are responsible for mood, um, and, and similar for addiction. So, so where do you where do you, where do you draw the line? I don't I don't know. Um, we do things like uh, with focused ultrasound, a procedure that we just did this morning. We open the blood brain barrier to deliver chemotherapy to a brain tumor in the context of a trial. So there, we're delivering ultrasound waves. We're opening the blood-brain barrier, um, but the blood-brain barrier is only open for about eight hours, and then it closes. It heals up again. So it's a temporary opening in the blood-brain barrier. But we've but we've caused a change in the physiology and microstructural environment of the brain. That is that is temporary, but we caused the change. Is that surgery? Um, I would say yes, it is because you know we are. If something happens uh, and we cause bleeding, you know, it can cause a, you know swelling, bleeding. And, Go. So one way is maybe you can define it based on what can go wrong. You know, if, if, if what can go wrong leads to a surgical emergency, then it's surgery, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, so that, that's one way we've sort of had to define, well, you know, um, for example, with the procedure that we did this morning, or even with, with ablative neurosurgery with ultrasound, can a neurologist do it? Does it have to be a neurosurgeon? You know, um, is it within the scope of a neurologist to do it? Um, can a neurosurgeon do ECT? You know, all of those questions have to do with, with, you know, boundaries and scope of practice, which I think at the end of the day speaks to invasiveness and how we define surgery. So um, I think it's it, that it, it really gets at the root of, of, of a lot of these things. Nice. Thank you. We have Louise and then Armie. Uh, hi, Dr. Lipsman. Um, I have a follow-up question. I was, I was kind of had the same line of thinking, I think, as um, Judy and Patrick uh, with questions about the balance between uh, innovation and regulation, the tension there. And I'm curious, um, you spoke to a little bit the tension between industry uh, or with industry that you've navigated. I, I'd be curious to hear about the tension um, within your roles being both a healthcare practitioner, so a deliverer um, of the neurotechnologies and a person who's on the ethical side um because i believe that these tensions can exist between healthcare professionals and between ethicists um so it's interesting um you would have a unique experience um as someone who's in has their foot in both both sides yeah for sure and um no that's a great question um i I view it as complementary um now there is the there's the logistical aspect of, of, of that question, which is for a lot of our trials, for example, I, I, I'm often not the first person to approach patients about their participation in a trial. I often, you know, uh, we, you know, consent is obtained, for example, formal study consent is obtained by somebody else who explains it. I'm always available, of course. So we have those practical separations that exist that try to enhance you know, the ability to obtain a, a, a consent and, and make sure that there's no undue pressure, et cetera. But in terms of the, the, um, the navigation and con- from a more conceptual perspective, um, I, I'm, I'm a strong believer that the two complement uh, each other. Uh, and I think that the, you know, my neurosurgical practice, uh, you know, very nicely complements, I think, my, my interest in ethics. You know, in the, the question that was asked me right before you by Roland, you know, speaks to that specifically. Um, and and you know, I think that I w- I'm in a position to sort of um, comment about surgical risk because I do surgery, uh, and also talk about uh, you know talk about that w- literally when I speak to patients and and have all these in front of them. So so it's not. I mean, I, I don't see it as a, as a tension as much as I see it as, as complementary, unless I'm doing it wrong, uh, which is which is could very well be. Um, but um, I'm also fortunate to have uh, with me a tremendous team of, of, of collaborators uh, with whom uh, we meet very regularly. So that, that, that's something that, you know, I can't really uh, overemphasize uh, enough, uh, which is that the work that we do um, doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, 
Uh, so for example, every one of, we have a kind of spokes of a wheel model where we have a, a core group um, uh, of people who run a lot of the trials, but each spoke of the wheel is a different indication. And we meet on a regular basis with so the psychiatric surgery or the psychiatry neuromodulation group will meet regularly on a monthly basis to discuss patient eligibility, to discuss the definition of who is reached treatment resistance, how our patients are doing, how we select patients, and these ethical issues as they arise. So, so these decisions are not made in a, in a vacuum. So I think that that's a, a major way that we mitigate uh, some of those conflicts and risks is, is really to work in a, in a really cohesive multidisciplinary group. Armi, over to you. Perfect, thank you so much, Dr. Lewisman. I've really enjoyed the presentation so far and, and your responses to some of the questions. And you actually kind of beat me to the punch here because my question was actually gonna be around collaboration. And you know, given the complexity of some of the issues you're trying to address and, and you know, particularly neuro neuromodulatory surgery, um, if you feel like the collaboration reflects you know, how much you're able to work with other, other disciplines, like for example, psychiatry, you mentioned ECT and, you know, mainly ECT is done by psychiatrists. And do you find like the collaboration is sufficient? Do you wish there was more? Are there other disciplines that you feel like might be emerging or have an emerging role in terms of neuromodulation? That's a, it's also a very, very good question. And is arguably the thing that gives me the most satisfaction from my job. And you really, I'm so grateful um, and privileged to work in a tremendous team um, of, of, of motivated, passionate collaborators. So uh, I take the view of the more, the better. Um, and um, we, we have excellent representation from psychiatry. Peter Jacoby is our, is our clinical lead on our neuromodulation program. He's a, he's a national leader in DBS and in TMS. Um, and we are, we're also recruiting a few other psychiatrists to the team. Uh, we have several neurosurgeons. Um, one of the most important additions to the team was made last year is uh, Dr. Jenny Rabin, who's a neuropsychologist. So um, neuro the, the neuropsychologic sequelae specifically of neuromodulation and psychiatric disorders is a underappreciated but extremely important aspect of this. Given the historic uh, effects of neuromodulation strategies like bilaterally CT, DBS, and other kinds of surgical procedures, capsulotomies on neuropsychologic function. So um, she's on the team. Um, over time, we hope to add, you know, people like social workers, you know, and um, physiotherapists, occupational therapists to, to work with our patients, try to optimize outcomes. In terms of other specialties, you know, I think it's critical that um, uh, if you're working in a certain domain, let's say addiction, that you have an addiction psychiatrist or addiction psychologist, if you're working with uh, eating disorders, if you have eating disorder specialists, I'm a strong believer in domain experts and domain expertise, uh, and, and, and not only in their ability to help you define and contextualize treatment resistant states, but also to, more importantly, contextualize the effects that you're seeing after the surgery. So we're increasingly um, recognizing that, for example, in, in, in psychiatric neurosurgery, that surgery is but one aspect of the treatment process, that as important is gonna be what patients do after the surgery, what kind of follow-up they have, what kind of treatment they engage in. So I think um, for that, you're gonna need an engaged team uh, that's involved. So, so it's, it's not only rewarding, it's actually critical for outcomes uh, that the team is multidisciplinary. Any other questions from the group? If not, I have a last one for Dr. Lipsman. So here, here it goes. Uh, many years ago, about 15 years ago, um, I was asked to comment on a case in uh, Europe where a 17-year-old woman uh, with uh, anorexia was implanted with uh, a deep brain stimulator, so older technology, prior times. Uh, and the stimulation ended up... Uh, improving her, her anorexia related depression, but not her depression. And because it was a trial, they explanted the electrode. And I, I wonder if you could comment on the ethics of explantation, the ethics of remediating through neurotechnology one condition, but not necessarily the target condition um, and some of the tensions around that. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, that's, that's interesting. Um, you know, that, that 
that was brought up. I mean, that, that's an area that's near and dear to me uh, because I mean, that's what my PhD was really in. Uh, and um, so we did, we did a trial. We ended up implanting, um, you know, about 22 patients with anorexia. And what we found was that, um, you know, when, when we started to create, when I started to look at the circuit map in the brain of the structures implicated in anorexia, um, the, one of the first things that, that became apparent is that you're not, you don't find structures that are important for things like appetite or basal metabolic rate or things like that. What you find implicated are limbic structures uh, that are important for mood, anxiety, fear, reward processing. So, um, so we targeted those circuits in the brain. Uh, and what we found was that unless you treat mood and anxiety, unless you treat comorbid mood and anxiety disorders, patients with anorexia will not improve. They won't gain weight. And if you treat their weight exclusively, either with artificial feeding or with a PEG tube or with an NG tube or however you want to treat them, and you don't treat their mood and anxiety, they will recur. Invariably, they will recur. So you have to treat the limbic circuit dysfunction and anorexia to succeed. And that for many in the field of neurosurgery was sort of counter counterintuitive. But for many people in, in psychiatry, it was like, yes, of course, that, that's what you have to do. You, you, you have to address the underlying cause. You, you see somebody with anorexia, the most obvious thing is their state of malnourishment. Uh, that's what you have to treat. But that's a very neurosurgical, simplistic way of looking at anorexia. We have to make, take a more sophisticated psychological approach, which is that it's being driven by underlying limbic reward circuit dysfunction. That's what we did. And in our experience, we did find that, you know, there were, there were promising effects of doing that. Um, but what was, what was for me, the most instructive part of that trial was not that it was also that, but, but it was the fact that what we found was that DBS in that context was not the treatment per se. It was, you know, what I called adjuvant treatment. It was just like you would take cancer. You would, it would not be enough to just cut out the cancer. Uh, you would need to do, you know, surgery, then you would need to follow it with chemotherapy and radiation therapy to really have a maximal effect. Similarly, in treatment-resistant psychiatric disease, surgery needs to be part of a larger treatment program that combines neuromodulation with standard of care treatments that maybe in the past have not worked. So, and that's what we found in our populations where you had patients who had tried and failed multiple treatment attempts in the past after surgery, began to re-engage with conventional guideline concordant care, whereas in the past they couldn't tolerate it. It was almost as if the networks in the brain had changed sufficiently to allow them to be more receptive to treatments that were previously ineffective. And some of them actually said that. They said almost like the, the noise in their brain was decreased so that, that now they can focus on therapy. Now they can, whereas in the past, maybe they had you know, uh, PTSD secondary to some abuse history or trauma, they could not access or touch that in therapy. Now with DBS, they're more regulated and they can access it. Uh, so it's not, so, so what, what DBS allowed them to do is almost like a pedestal that allowed them to reach somewhere that they could not reach before. So, and that's how I talk about DBS and neuromodulation in general with patients today. I say, I'm very wary of the notion and patients tell us this all the time, that this is my last resort. This is my last hope. This is all I have left. And if it's not this, then I don't have anything. So I very quickly disabuse them of that notion in clinic. It's one of the first things that I tell them. I tell them it's not the last resort. You have a treatment resistant disease, treatment resistant depression. Neuromodulation is the first treatment, the first step in treatment of treatment resistant disease. And what we can then do is add other treatments on top of that. Maybe previous treatments that didn't work, maybe therapy or other medication strategies, et cetera. Um, and that, that sort of changes the way that they view things a little bit. So I, I do think that, you know, not only is it dangerous to view DBS as a last resort, because if it doesn't work, patients are, are, are sort of at a wall. I think it's very important to, to view treatment resistant disease as its own unique, distinct disease that requires a different and distinct treatment approach of which neuromodulation is a part. Right, so that was brilliant. So let me invite everyone to give uh, Dr. Lipson a big round of applause with your reactions or your <laughs> physically you so.
Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.